Hello and welcome to Arcadia University's Biology 327 Histology course. This is uh, part four of the cytology lecture uh, and basically looking at uh, the remaining of the uh, subcellular organelles. Now we talked about the rough endoplasmic reticulum in the previous lecture and we said that the rough endoplasmic reticulum is a membrane bound network as a rough appearance because of the presence of ribosomes on the surface. Kind of a similar system is going to be found within the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. This again is going to be a membrane bound network, uh, but it's going to have a smooth appearance because it lacks ribosomes. And again, because it lacks ribosomes, uh, it can't make proteins. If we take a look at the overall appearance of this membrane bound network, this smooth endoplasmic reticulum, we can see that the cisterna or the spaces within the smooth endoplasmic reticulum are more tubular or more vesicular in appearance, kind of rounder in appearance, than the flattened appearance that we saw with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, if we take a look at the functions associated with the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, we're going to see a little bit more diversity, uh, depending upon the types of cells that we're focusing in on. Uh, the first are going to be steroid hormone secreting cells. Uh, the steroid hormone secreting cells are going to have a well-defined smooth endoplasmic reticulum because that region is going to be involved with both lipid metabolism as well as steroid hormone synthesis. Liver cells are also going to have a well-defined smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And within liver cells, uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is going to be involved with glycogen breakdown and with detoxification. And then finally, at least finally here for this example, uh, muscle cells uh, are going to have uh, a well-defined smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And in this case, uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of muscle cells is going to be referred to as the sarcoplasma reticulum. Uh, and that's going to be involved with calcium storage. So again, uh, sequestering the materials, but in this case, uh, holding those materials until uh, the triggered release is needed to control muscle contraction. The second unit, or second subcellular unit we're going to look at in this mini lecture is going to be the mitochondria. Uh, the mitochondria are going to be involved with generating energy within the cell within cellular, the process of cellular respiration. Now, outside of the nucleus, the mitochondria are going to be the largest of the organelles uh, within uh, the cell. Uh, and if we take a look at them, they're going to have a double membrane structure and a relatively complicated structure when we take a look at it. Uh, membrane-bound structures and membrane-bound regions within this are going to have what are referred to as shelf-like cristae, uh, kind of flattened uh, kind of folds that are going to be present there, but lots of membrane-bound structures within the mitochondria itself. And the mitochondria are going to be very, very prevalent in cells requiring a lot of energy, uh, like muscle cells and kidney tubule cells. Now, if we take a look at this, again, with this idea that when we have these membrane-bound regions, they're present for a specific function. And so what we're going to see is that these membrane-bound regions are going to be involved with generating energy or with organizing other things that are going to be involved with reduction of energy. And so if we take a look at this, again, we said the mitochondria had uh, a double membrane. So we've got an outer mitochondrial membrane and an inner mitochondrial membrane and then the spaces between them. So the outer mitochondrial membrane is relatively smooth and porous, but it's going to be permeable for small molecules, almost like food-like molecules, to be brought into it. We're going to have that inner membrane space, and then we're going to have the inner mitochondrial membrane. The inner mitochondrial membrane is going to be less permeable, so things are going to move across it less easily, and only when it's, it's being controlled in most cases. And this is where we're going to have the ATPases. This is where we're going to have the electron transport chain, so essentially those membranes, uh, those membrane about proteins that you talked about when you talked about cellular respiration, for the, the movement of the electrons down uh, from a high energy to a lower energy state, but coupling that with the ability to generate ATP. And then finally, at the innermost portion in the matrix, so inside that inner mitochondrial membrane, is where we're going to have the enzymes for the Krebs cycle, so the TCA uh, portion of cellular respiration. So breaking it down and essentially squeezing out as much energy as possible, all of these enzymes are going to be found within the mitochondrial matrix. Now, they're going to be a variation of the mitochondria. 
the mitochondria with the shelf like cristae are going to be the traditional mitochondria uh, involved with producing lots and lots of ATP energy within the cell. But there are also going to be some mitochondria with tubular cristae. So instead of the, the flattened cristae, the shelf like cristae, they're going to be more tubular in appearance, rounder in appearance. Uh, and these are going to be prevalent within steroid hormone secreting cells. And they're going to be involved with the actual process and, and formation of the steroid hormones. And then the final elements within the cell that we're going to talk about within this introduction to cytology is going to be the cytoskeleton. And so, like the skeleton of your body, the cytoskeleton is going to be involved with supporting the cell, and it's going to be involved with movement. And so, instead of bones, like the bones in your skeleton, within the cytoskeleton, the skeleton of the cell, we're going to have some filamentous proteins. But they're going to have some similar functions. They're going to provide some structural stability. They're going to maintain the shape of the cell, like the skeleton maintains the shape of the body, involved with movement, as well as rearrangement of things uh, within the cell. So if we take a look at this, there are going to be three uh, main types of cytoskeletal elements. The first are going to be the microtubules. And the microtubules are going to be the largest or the thickest of the cytoskeletal elements. These are going to be hollow, non-branching cylinders um, that essentially are going to form like railroad tracks within uh, the cell itself. Now, the important thing to recognize is like railroad tracks, these things don't contract. The only way to shorten a microtubule is to depolymerize them, essentially break down uh, the individual subunits, break it down from there. But what we see is by forming these almost like railroad tracks, they're going to form uh, a pathway for molecules to move within the cell. Now the diagram on the bottom is actually showing um, cells walking out along actin, but the same type of thing is going to be occurring with molecular motors and microtubules. And so basically what happens is, like a little locomotive, dynein and kinesin, these little molecular motors, are going to attach to the microtubules and they're going to move out along them. And like a locomotive, they're going to drag whatever's behind them. And so the microtubules are going to form the railroad tracks, the dynein and the kinesin as molecular motors are going to attach to things like cytoplasmic vesicles. The vesicular movement that we talked about in one of the previous lectures, these things aren't moving randomly, they're not moving by diffusion, they're going to be directed, and it's going to be directed by being dragged along these different microtubules. Chromosome movement during mitosis is essentially establishing this microtubules. We're going to have little motors that are going to attach to the centromeres of the chromosome, and as they move out along the microtubule, they're going to drag on the centromeres and they're going to pull the chromosomes apart and separate them during mitosis. We can also see uh, a specialized accumulation of formation of the microtubules in things like the cellular projections of cilia or flagella, which are going to be molotov. They're going to be able to beat or they're going to be able to, to move, again, because of the interaction within these microtubules and these little molecular motors. <coughs> The second type of, my, of, uh, inter, of cytoskeletal elements are going to be the microfilaments. And the microtubules were the thickest. The microfilaments are going to be the thinnest, about 5 to 7 nanometers in diameter. And in essence, the microfilaments are going to be solid rods of actin. And so they're going to be very good for support, but they're also going to have a variety of functions within the cell. Um, most of the time when you think about actin, you think about the sliding filament uh, arrangement within muscle cells where, in essence, you've got these solid rods of actin that are being dragged by the myosin molecules. So the actin isn't contracting, but they're sliding across the myosin. The myosin motors are essentially pumping it, moving it along, and causing the entire cell to contract. Similarly, we can look at equatorial constriction, which occurs during cytokinesis. This is when the cell is dividing, and you've got that pinching in at the the equator, the, the central portion, it's going to pinch off and squeeze this into two separate cells. Uh, in essence, what you're doing there is like pulling out a little purse string, pulling on these actin filaments and causing the, uh, the membrane which is attached to it to collapse down and separate it into two distinct cells. Lots of uh, important roles in structure, uh, the microfilament, the actin filaments are going to be involved with cell shape, uh, they're going to be the core of the microvilli, uh, as well as being involved with the movement of some of these cytoplasmic organelles. 
And then finally, the last of the cytoskeletal elements are going to be the intermediate filaments. The intermediate are described that way because they're intermediate length between the larger microtubules and the narrower microfilaments. Now, when we take a look at the intermediate filaments, what we're going to see is a lot of diversity, uh, lots of different functions, lots of different uh, specific characteristics, specific types of these intermediate filaments, depending upon the type of cell that we're looking at. In many cases, these are identifiable based on the cell we're looking at. Uh, but the general functions is they're going to be involved with cell shape, uh, many times involved with distributing stress within the cell. So they're essentially going to be involved with stabilizing uh, the cell. So if we can take a look at this, some examples of these intermediate filaments. Uh, keratin found in the epithelial cells of the epidermis, uh, the skin cells in essence, uh, are going to be involved with giving a lot of strength and support to these cells and a lot of strength and support to the outer surface of the skin. So the skin is maintained um, as a, a coherent layer. Uh, neurofilaments are going to be intermediate filaments that are found within, say, the axons and the dendrites, those very thin cellular processes that are extending out from the cell that need to be supported. Uh, similarly, the gliofibrillary acidic proteins are going to be um, a type of supportive uh, filament, which is going to be found in the non-neuronal cells, uh, the glial cells, within the nervous system. And this ends uh, our introduction to cytology, our introduction to cell biology, but hopefully after this series of lectures, you've got uh, a better understanding about these different uh, cellular organelles, cellular structures, what they're doing under normal circumstances, and then as we go through this course, we're going to look at what they're doing within specific and unique cell types. Thank you, and I'll see you at the next lecture.